Awesome, thank you. All right, um, I kind of already took a poll of what languages you guys know, but let me start with one more little poll after I introduce myself. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, my name is John McCord. I'm the headmaster of a school here in Greenville called Veritas Preparatory School. We are a university model school, which means that from kindergarten to fifth grade, the students come into school two days a week and then are homeschooled the other days a week. And then at sixth grade and then on up, um, they come in three days a week and then work at home those other days a week. So it's, it's kind of this neat fusion. My, my background, actually, I taught for um, eight years up in Chicago in a five-day-a-week classical Christian school. Um, and so that was my background. Um, and then as I've gotten more and more into the UMS system, the university model system of schools, I've realized there's really an awesome, and, and you all know this as homeschoolers, um, there's an awesome thing that happens when parents really understand what their kids are doing, um, whether that's conversations at home or whether it's really just being able to be intentional about going out. We're, I shared this already, but right now in science, natural philosophy, um, we're in astronomy. And so basically our astronomy lessons consist of um, we teach them about a constellation, how to find it, what to look for up in the night sky. And then over the next two weeks, our students have to go out they have to document the weather conditions when they went out, and they have to find and draw what they were able to see. Um, and so, for example, when we learned Orion, some, some students on some nights were able to see more or less of the key stars in Orion, so the belt, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and the sword sheath. But depending on where you lived in Greenville, you maybe didn't see all of that because of light pollution or anything else. So um, we do a lot of observation-based, but also a lot of home-based things, especially in science. Um, art and music, though we also do those in school. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, just a quick poll as far as Latin goes. On a scale of zero being, I'm here because people told me that Latin's something that is good and I don't, I know that Latin is spelled with five letters and the, you capitalize the first one. You do capitalize the first one in case you, anyway, so I'm a zero um, up to three I read classics in college, or I, you know, I've sat down and I can read Caesar um, at sight. Um, how many of us are zeros in the room? Okay. That, that's a horrible thing to say. Who here is a zero? All right, show those hands, zeros. No, I'm just kidding. Um, maybe I should do it on a grading scale. That's better. Anyway, um, one, like you've had a little bit. Okay. Twos, you're, you're kind of mastered grammar. And then threes, you can sit down and read by sight. Okay, Awesome. This is, a, this is an hour long, really dedicated more to the zero one. I hope if you're a two or a three and you're here, you'll still you know, glean some things. Um, but really my goal is uh, twofold. One is I wanna talk about why you should learn Latin or really what classical education is and how Latin fits into that structure. Um, and then secondly, we're gonna do all of third grade and probably all of fourth grade Latin in a nutshell today, okay? So before we talk about Latin itself, um, just a quick comment for those of you who came in later. This is my YouTube channel. Um, I don't get any money from it. It's just a, if you want to go, I've got a bunch of videos, and you can reach me through that channel. Um, and even if you ask you know, nicely, I will gladly make a video for you about anything you're wondering. Um, and, I, and that's just a resource that I love to have out there for moms and dads who are, who are just like me. I didn't have Latin. I proudly proclaim I am a child of the ruins, but I am helping rebuild. That is, man... I love that j job. It is so fun to work with fifth graders who, who literally know more in fifth grade than I learned up to my, my freshman year, sophomore year in college. It's awesome. It is awesome to be part of the rebuilding. But um, I, did not, I did not come there because I grew up in it. I came there after the fact. So uh, first I want to talk about classical education. There are sheets when you come in. Um, these sheets, the purpose of them, if you didn't get one, again, you can reach me through that and I will gladly email you one if we ran out. But these sheets are full of quotes. I am not going to read you all these quotes. But if one of the things that kind of bothered me when I was learning and as, as I'm still learning about classical education, it always bothered me when people would talk about, well, the Greeks say, the Romans say, or whatever. And I would always wonder, yeah, but who says that? And where do I find that? And so on this, I, there are tons of quotes. Um, I know this is bad as a speaker. You're not supposed to give things out to this before you speak because you'll lose your audience. But I just, you know, I'm just going to disobey that rule. But um, this is full of quotes. Every quote has its citation. You can go and you can find these things. And basically, that's just my way of saying, my name is John McCord, but I didn't make this stuff up. Um, there is nothing. My goal is to never do anything new. My goal is to say, yeah, we've been doing that for over 2,000 years. And I'm so glad to be a part of that tradition. 
So everything that I do, um, and hopefully everything that I say, did not originate with me, that it ultimately originated with God, which is what I want to talk about first. So classical education, I was at an education conference up in Chicago um, last year, right around this time, and one of the headmasters of probably the, the biggest and most popular Christian school in the area, he kind of pulled me aside and he said, John, let me get this straight. Here, here's kind of what I understand classical education to be about. And he said, all of us doing kind of modern Christian education, we're over here and we're, we're trying to bust out the iPads and we're trying to get test scores up and we're, you know, we, we're kind of goal oriented in that way. And he said, and then you guys in classical, you're talking about virtue and, you know, desiring wisdom and wanting to have a love for beautiful things. And he's like, that's just wild to me. And I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, that's, that's really what we do. And so for us, someone asked uh, before we started, what's your schedule of the day? We start with 10 minutes of looking at a beautiful piece of art or listening to a piece of a symphony. First thing we do every day. That's not original to me. But that's our goal is that we could be able to sit and reflect and develop our palate, so to speak. I I am unabashedly a fan of Taco Bell and I, I... joke with that because I'll always say to my wife, I'm going to go with some fresh Mexican food. Um, they've got this, this little place. They make their own homemade salsa. And she's like, shut up. You know, come on. And it's Taco Bell. That, that would be an undeveloped palate, right? But the issue is we all have undeveloped palates, especially in our society nowadays where I am the trump card, right? Well, I like it. I think it sounds good to me. And so what we do is to start our day in classical tradition is we want to, we want to draw them up to the things that are beautiful. We want, to, we want them to feel like, like how you feel if you ever walk into a big, beautiful, old cathedral. Do you know what I'm talking about? And you walk in and you have this moment where you go, <sighs> that is architecture designed to draw you up. It literally draws the eyes up, but it's meant to draw you up. And that's what classical education <laughs> believes at its core. We believe that we, we are made in God's image. Um, reading the pagan Quintilian, he says it this way. He says, human beings are so amazing that it's said that the soul descends from heaven itself. And that's a pagan saying, look, the reason why we need to do education is because we're not animals, kind of like how we start sometimes. I have a two-year-old at home. He has no patience. He, or, you know, very little. I mean, he just, he has no virtue. And I love my boy so dearly and so I'm not busting on him. I'm just saying... He has to learn patience. He has to learn perseverance. He has to learn, I have a four-year-old at home, and he has to learn how to lose graciously and gracefully. And he has to learn how to win graciously and gracefully. He has to learn what it means to be a full, capital H, human being. Okay, Because as we learned from the ancients, errare est humanum, which means to err is human, Right? And we don't want to just be humans, though we make mistakes all the time. But what's the counterpoint to that? To err is human, but to forgive is divine. And so as parents and as teachers, we don't want to leave our children, our pupils, where they are. But we want to actually draw them up. We want to teach them to forgive. Because it's divine. And so our goal, our, our telos, our aim, the thing that the finish line for us is to say, I want to be like the supreme divine example. And that's how we pick our curriculum. The question is, how could I raise up students who, in a nutshell, would be like Christ in the Christian tradition? How could I raise up students who would say, man, I'm going to go through the cross. I'm going to go through extreme pain because of the glory that's beyond that. Okay, put it this way. I'm going to put up with the pain of Mount Everest so that I can stand on top of Mount Everest. Yeah. And so that's how we start asking this question of, well, what are we doing and what are we trying to accomplish? And so for classical educators, not only are we asking the question of what curriculum do we choose, but especially as home educators, we're asking, what are the things that we can do in our households that will instill these habits and virtues that we want our kids to have? Two things that I do with my boys that I love that I do with my boys. We bird watch and we garden. We bird watch and we garden. And the reason is is because there is amazing beauty that comes after you've waited. Because especially I find in our culture, 
we are an instantly gratified, desiring, instant gratification, fast food nation. Okay? And so when we watch birds, the beautiful thing about watching birds is besides kind of laying out some seed, there ain't a thing you can do. You know, you, you can sit by the window and you can wait for the blue jays to show up. And thankfully now we have a family of blue jays and a family of cardinals that shows up. And man, my, he was 18 months old um, and he, he would get so excited. Rush would get so excited to have those birds come down. He would go crazy. He'd get so excited he'd scare them off. But he has to wait. Gardening, what do we learn? We have to learn that we have to work. Absolutely. We have to, to tend. We have to plant. We have to water. But we don't make it grow. We don't make it grow. And so we have our part to play. But ultimately, um, you start picking tomatoes before they're ready. It's not very good. It's just not going to work that way. And so there is patience tied up, um, not only in how God acts with us, but ultimately how we want our children to act with other people. And so whether it's home or whether it's in the academic context, so to speak, we want to draw our children up to things that they don't possess naturally. And the word for that is virtue. That's what that is, is habits of the mind and of the heart that incline us towards the good. That's what we're after. And again, there, there are quotes there. Okay. And so the ancient answer kind of to this question of how do you instill virtue was this, this term you've heard called the liberal arts. The liberal arts. And uh, I can't remember who it was this morning. Somebody quoted Dante, and it's a beautiful quote. Um, if you heard it, oh my goodness. Oh, the quote is this, is after, after um, Dante's been led through purgatory by Virgil, Latin poet, he, he gets out and he's about to get, get out and Virgil says to him, you, I, I, what is it? I crown and miter you Lord of yourself. How do you master yourself? Louis XVI said it this way, um, any man who can master himself can master the world, right? Or you could say it this way, the biggest problem probably with you is in your mirror. And I'm not saying that judgmentally at all because I got a mirror. And I look at myself all the time in it. And so I know that's my problem. And so in the classical tradition, one of the things that they decided, what they figured out is we have to teach people to think rightly. We, have, we don't come out thinking rightly. Uh, you know, if I let my two-year-old eat food whenever he wanted, he would eat it raw and wriggling, and, you know, just as much as well-cooked because he just doesn't know what's best for him. And so in the classical tradition, we kind of divide that knowledge down, so to speak, or divide that training down into the verbal arts and the mathematical arts. The verbal arts, um, how to read a book, how to speak, how to write. And that discipline of how to read, how to write, that was called grammar. The Greek is grammatike, which gets translated into the Latin, and the Latin word is literatura. You can hear literature, right? Literatura. And so if you're going to learn your letters so that you can read your letters, grammar is what you study, so to speak. So um, if you look on your sheets, if you've got it, uh, just one quick little quote here um, under what is grammar. Um, uh, I'll go to um, the second quote down, which is, uh, this is from Clark and Jane. This is a, a book called The Liberal Arts, which is probably the best one volume work on classical education that I've seen. Kind of, there's no elevator pitch for classical education. This is as close to elevator pitch as you're going to get. But um, that book is great. It's about 180 pages, I think. And here's their summary of what grammar is, although it's a negative summary. They say, the notion that the primary goal of studying classical languages is something other than the reading of classical texts would have been foreign to earlier generations. That is to say, if people say, well, why Latin? Here's my short answer. So that I can read Latin books. So that I can learn from the dead so that I can read Virgil's words in Virgil's words, so that I can read Horace's words in Horace's words. And if you were at Chris Parent's talk this morning, are there other tools and benefits we get from Latin? Absolutely. It trains your mind like nothing else. Absolutely. It teaches you all of these virtues that are ultimately the goal of true education. But the reason specifically for learning Latin or I would even say learning Spanish or German, is so that you can commune with the people who speak in that language. That's the goal. The goal of Latin is not to look smart. It's not a party trick. It's not about SAT scores. I'm going to try to step on everyone's toes. Here we go. It's not about SAT scores. It's not, it's not about any of those things. It's ultimately about what it does to your soul when you learn to be able to talk to dead men and women. 
it's awesome when fifth graders realize that they are learning things that have been learned and said and written for 2,000 years. That's big. That's big. That's Gothic architecture. That draws you up out of pop culture. And so that's what Latin does for us, among other things. Okay? So I promised earlier I would answer this question. But why Latin? So, for example, right, we could commune with, with Germans live and dead. We could commune with Spanish live and dead. And you should. I'm going to argue that you should. And I'm, I'm going to give my answer many fold. But let me start off by saying this. One of the dangers I found of, in modern languages is, is this, is that in modern languages, we can, we can choose the wrong end and we get it wrong. Here's Ben Franklin's answer. So Ben Franklin in his autobiography is talking about how to educate kids. And he actually goes on a diatribe against Latin. So I'd quote to pick, but here you go. Ready? And Ben Franklin says this. He says, when I was a schoolboy, they made me learn Latin and it was so hard and it was so complex. It's like if you took a carpenter and you said, I need you to make a set of stairs and you had him start at the top stair and then try to, you know, work his way down from the top. He says, that's what Latin is. You shouldn't do it that way. And I would say, Brother Ben, I agree. That is what Latin is. That's why you should do it that way. Because the thing is, is if we can launch our students out with precision, accuracy, care, diligence, patience, with all those things, learning Spanish is cake. I had an eighth grader. She wanted to learn Spanish. A year of Spanish in one week. One week. And that's not because she was a genius. It's because she had learned her grammar. Spanish grammar, as you guys will see, is much easier. German grammar, much easier. Hebrew grammar is a kind of a beast of its own, so I can't talk about that. Greek grammar, same thing. And so if you start with Latin, Ben is exactly right. You are starting at the top step. But let's do it when they're in third grade, right? No one would ever say to your violin, your child's violin teacher, you know, holding the bow correctly is so hard. Could you just like let her kind of squeak it across the strings? And I'm sure she'll get the right sounds out eventually. No, I love basketball. Go Duke. No booze? All right. Okay. Go Duke. Right. Um, but, but you would never say to your child who's learning a sport, you know, who cares if you're doing it the right way? Just kind of chuck the ball up at the basket and I'm, I'm sure it'll work out eventually. You're not getting a scholarship that way. It don't work that way. So Latin is this additional blessing because you never confuse the purpose of Latin of being so that we can speak and go on a vacation. It's not, right? Like, how do you ask where the bathroom is in Latin? Donde esta el baño, right? I mean, you all have been in these classes where you're, you're going, oh, you, it kind of gets hijacked by the traveler agenda, right? How do you say suitcase in Spanish? Does anybody remember? Equipaje, y'all, come on. Anyway, so, and the reason why, I, I remember being in sixth grade in Texas and learning how to say luggage and the porter and, you know, all these, el tren, you know, these things like this. And why? So that you could go travel to Spain and speak Spanish. Latin never suffers from that because it's dead. You know, you're not going to ask a dead man where the bathroom is. It just doesn't work that way. And it's, and it's great because of that, because we don't lose our focus on what our true goal is. Our true goal is to learn how to read. And in that process, amazing things happen. Okay. Now, Before we transition to learning Latin, I want to talk about two virtues that I think you're going to see, and then I want to ask, give a time for just any questions so far that I can clarify. Two virtues that I've seen happen in my students are two things that we want to focus on. The first is this, and this has been talked about a bit already this weekend, is this this Latin idea of multum non multa, which means much, not many. Or we could say it this way. It's better to scuba dive over coral reefs than to jet ski over coral reefs. You know what I mean? Not only will it mess up your ski do or whatever you're on, but you'll get to see beauty. And you don't see beauty when you're jet skiing. I have a cousin who's a professional hiker. And what that means is he does trails all the time. Six months, five months, eight month trails. And when I see the pictures that he gets to take going three miles an hour, they're so much better than I could take driving 75 miles an hour. That's the essence of multum non multa. One of the things that that comes up when I look at Latin curriculum and when I look at what most parents do with their kids, and please, I don't know you, so I'm I'm not knocking what you do, but generally speaking, you're doing too much. You're going too quickly, and you're not getting the key concepts. 
you're just going too quickly. And we're going to see why that doesn't work in Latin. The second thing that I think Latin does, or kind of the chief virtue that I see in my students instilled, is, is the, the Latin term is patientia. Anybody hear an English word there? Patientia? Patience. Okay. Quick, quick comment on patience. Patience comes from the word patior, which means I suffer. <laughs> Do you know that? P- patience is defined as the ability to suffer over a long amount of time. Patior is related to the English word passion. So, for example, a passion play or the film The Passion of the Christ. It's related to that Latin root. It's not, it's not that Jesus was super emotional. It's that he was able to look at the goal and suffer with his eye on the prize. Okay? Right? It's that he could buffet his body, Paul says. I buffet my body with my eye to the prize. Julius Caesar has a great quote. I, I gave it to you, but, man, I love when a general talks about suffering because you know he knows what it means. And he says, it's so much easier to find men who are willing to go out and die in a blaze of glory than someone who is willing to suffer for victory. It is hard to hurt. It is hard to hurt. Do you hear how God can use something like Latin? It is hard to hurt. And Latin makes you get focused. Okay? Before we learn some Latin, a year and a half at least of Latin, Pause real quick. Any questions as far as what I've covered now? That is a very quick airplane flyover of, of some of these things. Yeah. I love them. I love them. The reason why I'd start with Latin, and actually um, I'm going to put some, I'm going to put a word up on the board. The reason why I would start with Latin and why I think it's better than beginning with Greek is because you don't have to learn a separate alphabet. That's kind of in a nutshell. Um, so real quick, we're going to, we're going to do Latin and y'all are going to learn some verbs. Um, So I'm just going to put this up now because we're going to use it. And you've probably seen this, and this might even send you into fits of, like, hysteria. Um, But if you learn Latin, you're going to get pretty close to learning Greek. So I'll put the Greek equivalent up as well. And I'm going to explain this in just a second. But so your eyes should be more scared of this side of the board than this side of the board, right? Like, when your eyes see Greek, it's almost... It can be overwhelming. There are some letters you probably recognize. That kind of looks like an E. It is. It's an epsilon. It kind of looks like an I. It's an iota, right? Okay, that's a sigma. Okay, that looks like an S. But then you see certain things like that in your eyes. Your eyes scan that. Your English eyes what tell you that's what letter? A V, and it's not. It's an N. It's a new. And so when you're teaching kids early on, and, and we're still really honing in our, our English composition and our English writing, I... I found that I'd much rather do that second than this second. You know what I mean? Because the cool thing about then learning Greek is you could, oh, you can chew Greek up and spit it out. You can do Hebrew just as much, Um, though it's very different. Um, I've taken ninth grade Latin students and done after school Greek sessions, Hebrew sessions with them. And I could say, well, Hebrew doesn't actually work with case. I'm going to explain that in just a second. Hebrew doesn't work with case. It actually uses direct object markers rather than case endings. And room full of ninth graders. Oh, okay, that makes sense. because we're trying to learn the grammatical concepts underlying it. And as we learn how Latin works, we actually will appreciate or maybe unappreciate more how English doesn't work, okay, in several ways. Any other questions? One more, yeah. Um, if we were interested in having our child learn another language, yes. would we not introduce them to that language until after they learn Latin? Then? Here's what I would say. Here's my goal. I'll also put it this way. Um, my goal is to get as much of the heavy lifting of education in earlier, not because it's easier for the student, but because they're able to start delighting in things like we're going to do together. I'm going to make you all stand up and recite some things, so get ready for that. Um, they can take a delight in this that if you didn't start to this till later, they just wouldn't. And, and I'm not saying that college students like going into German class and doing some of these things, but if I train you how to do this, you at least see why it's necessary. So the reason why I start with Latin is because, as Ben Franklin said, it is the top of the stairs. That's why I start with it, is because I think I can get third graders to do it. So don't introduce another foreign language prior to that. I I can tell you, um, I will not with my voice. That that would be my answer to it. (laughs) But maybe after they've done something like this, maybe I'd introduce them to Greek. If, if, you know, Levi, let's say, if he really wanted to do it, my four-year-old, sure, we'll do it. But... 
But we're going to focus on this, and I think it'll be enough. Okay, let me press on to Latin so that we can actually get through some things. Okay. Uh, who can tell me what a verb is? What's a verb? Okay, that's only half a definition. Oh, an action word or staying state of being. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with verbs. The verbs are action words or states of being. Here we go. I need an example of a verb. Play, good. I need an example of a verb. Talk, good. I need an example of a verb. Awesome. Okay, so our first part of speech that we play with when we learn Latin or any language is we want to play with verbs because that's actually the stuff that's happening in any sentence, right? And so one thing that you can do with your kids as you're teaching them is take them on a walk and just say, what verbs do you see going on? So you walk around, you see the trees blowing, right? You can hear birds chirping. And you can hear and let them see all these things, right? Clouds moving. You can hear cars breaking, whatever that is. Because verbs are the stuff going on all around us all the time. And that's our first part of speech. Now, in English, this first concept is really hard to grasp as we move into Latin because English does not do what Latin and all other Romance languages do. Okay? It just doesn't do this. In Latin, what we have to do, and in Spanish and in German and on and on, what we do is we do a process called conjugating the verb. And conjugo literally means to yoke up, okay? My dad was a preacher, and we had an ox yoke in our... He was also a farmer. And so we had an ox yoke in our garage. He still has it, even though they live downtown Chicago. Um, And it's hanging up in his condo. But anyway, that's just my dad in a nutshell. Um, And and what we're doing when we conjugo, when we conjugate, is we're taking a stem... And we're putting an ending on it. We're taking a stem and we're putting an ending on it. And by the way, if you want a a little space, there is space on the back of your sheet for what we're going to do, as well as a glossary. It's right there on the bottom. Okay. So with a verb, what we need to do is we have to figure out, okay, who is my subject for this verb? Okay. And again, if you know Spanish, this is going to be easy for you because Spanish does this. Right? So you could say, for example, yo hablo inglés. I try to at least. Okay? Um, in Latin, when we need our subject noun to be a first person singular, I, the ending of the verb will be O. If we have a second person singular, you, the ending will be S or S. If we have a third person, Caesar, Brutus, he, she, it, Mary Magdalene, whoever it is, the ending will be a T. Those are our singular endings. If we have a verb, and it's a we verb, so we do something, it's going to end in a mus, second person plural, a tis, and a third person plural, an int. Now I need you all to put down your pencils and stand up. We need to do some recitation. Okay. I'm going to explain more. Um, This is where the type A moms go. Could you just explain that again? Yeah, we'll get to it. Here we go. Okay. So we're all going to recite together these endings. And they go like this. They go, ost, mustisnt. Because Latin, unlike English, always plays by its phonetic rules. So that's why we pronounce the phonetic sounds. Those of you who hate English spelling, you should because it's horrible. But Latin and Greek always play by their phonetic rules. It's really nice. Okay, here we go. So we're going to say our endings. And, and our endings are ost, mustis, nt. Again, ost, mustis, nt. Again, ost, mustis, nt. All right, take a seat. So what we're going to use when we're teaching Latin is we've got to use always a combination of memory skills and memory devices, recitations, things like that. But then we always have to couple it with the concept of what's going on. So at the bottom of the back of the sheet, I gave you three verbs. And I'm just going to pick, uh, I'll pick the, I I don't remember which one it is. But I'm going to pick the verb creo, creo, creare. Can anybody guess, I didn't give you the definition of that verb, because this is where derivatives belong. Does anybody think you know an English word that uses that Latin stem? Create. Create. Give me another one. What? It's, uh, no, but it could be nouns as it comes into English. So create. How about the person who does the creating? Creator. creator. How about the thing that the creator makes? Creation. So they all come from this Latin verb creo, which means I, uh, pardon me, I create. So the way that this ends up looking when we take our stem and we add our ending 
is we take our stem, creo, creare, and all we need to do is add our endings so that we can see, well, who or what is this subject? For those of you who came in late, you can feel free to move up so you can see this. I, I can't use PowerPoint for language. It just doesn't work. Okay. So all we've done, remember, conjugate, stem plus endings. All we've done is we've taken our verb stem, creo, creare, and we've just added endings. So if I wanted to say in Latin, I create, I could just say creo. And if I wanted to say in the beginning, God creates, though it's a past tense verb, but forgive me for that. God creates, I would say creat, deus creat. And if I want to say that we create, can anybody give it to me? Creamos. And if I want to say they create, I would say Crayons, right? Pop quiz time. Stand up. <laughs> Here we go. Let's say our active endings. They are ost, mustisnt. Again, ost, mustisnt. Sedata. Okay. So well, now we've got our endings, and you've kind of got a little bit of the concept. By the way, we're still in third grade. Children of the Ruins, right here, okay? So we could start to play with it, okay? Let's grab another verb. Uh, I gave you also the verb porto portare. What do you guys think porto means? Ah, oh, carry, I carry, right? It's portable, you can carry it. When you bring something in, you import it. When you send something out, you, when you move it across, you? Yeah, okay. So we're gonna grab porto and here we go. I'm gonna write a bunch of forms and I need, I need courage. Who, who will be a courageous volunteer? Remember how I said education is about virtue? Do you remember that? Here's courage. Come on up. Welcome. You're going to do fine. Have you ever learned Latin before? No, sir. I like it. Okay. What's going to happen is I'm going to point at a form and I'm going to say it just for the sake of audio people. And then I want you to try to translate it into English. And do you remember what the verb porto means? What's that root mean? Uh, it means I carry. I carry. Okay? So if we see the form portamos, what is that? We carry. How about if you see the word porto? I carry. And how about portas? We carry. Take a seat. Give him a hand. <laughs> that's why you teach. Right there. Man, that's awesome. Okay. So... What we do is we take a stem and we add an ending. And when we add that ending, we change the meaning of the subject, right? Or we change the subject of the verb. Okay, he was not a plant. I swear to you that. I told my students they were not allowed to come to this session. Okay, so that's how verbs work in Latin. Okay, this is not how verbs work in English. Ready? I swim, you swim, he swims, we swim, y'all swim, they swim. How do verbs conjugate in English? You add an S randomly in the third person singular. Okay, that's a great rule. But how about I am? I am, you, are, we, he, we, y'all, they. So sometimes the second person singular also doubles as the first, second, and third person plural. Just tuck that note away in your mind. No, Latin does not work that way. Latin is the Romans, baby. The Romans build aqueducts from aqua aqua, meaning water, and duco ducere, I lead. So aqueducts literally lead water. Anyway, um, they build aqueducts and they last 2,000 years and their grammatical structures last 2,000 years. These babies, you can open up a Bible and you can see mus at the end of a verb. And just from today, you can go, eh, it's, a, it's a we verb. It's a we is the subject of that verb. <laughs> It's that easy. So that's basically about a quarter to half of our third grade year playing with those verbs. Why? Because that's, that's a whole part of speech. I don't have to go fast. I can go slowly. Verbs. Verbs conjugate based on their subject. So we could say, if we're talking about ver or pardon me, um, parts of speech relationships, verbs and subject nouns are intimately related, right? And you try to do this with your students when you're teaching them to write, right? Well, you can't have that form of the verb because the subject is this, and your student's looking at you like, what are you talking about? I, sometimes I change the verb and sometimes I don't. Latin helps us learn English. By learning the foreign, we learn the native. 
It's amazing. So that my third graders, I can say, oh, check your subject verb agreement. And I know it's their Latin part of their brain that's kicking in. And they're going, oh, that's right. OK, I've got a third person singular verb. Okay. Another thing, though, that Latin does that's different than English is not only do verbs change, but nouns change. Okay? So verbs change based on their subject. Nouns change based on their job. Okay? Nouns change based on their job, which means what is that noun doing in the sentence? Okay? This is given to me by a student. Um, when I lived in Israel, um, we, my roommate and I got really bored uh, one night, and so we made superhero animals to take to Hebrew class the next day. And um, so one year I gave my students a challenge. If they wanted to create a superhero animal, they could do that. This is Super Bunny. And um, Super Bunny would be a noun, right? be a proper noun. And I could use Super Bunny in any number of ways in a sentence. For example, I could say, Super Bunny is white, subject noun. I could say, Super Bunny wears a cape, subject noun. I could say, John throws Super Bunny. What's Super Bunny doing there? Direct object. John catches Super Bunny. What's Super Bunny doing there? Direct object. And I will throw this around my classroom. Because I need you to realize we're playing with things. Nouns are things. Nouns are people. They're things you see, touch, taste, smell. Right? That is what a noun is. And so for our third grade year, the only other thing we work on in all of third grade is I have to get you to understand how nouns work in Latin. And here's how nouns work in Latin. Subject nouns look a certain way. Direct object nouns look a certain way. And we have really fancy, big words that are just so, oh, my word, all these syllables. And I do this with my third graders even. Oh, these syllables, what am I going to do with these things? But when a noun is going to be our subject noun, we say, we call it putting it in the nominative case. I need you guys to say nominative. nominative. Good. It's say nominative again. Nominative. nominative. Good. So in Latin, our subject noun goes into the nominative case. Okay. Our direct object noun goes into the accusative case. Say accusative. accusative. Say accusative. Good. So the direct object is going to go into the accusative. And if you ever want to think of, well, how can I remember those fancy names? You could think of, if somebody was accusing you of something, right, they'd point directly at you. It was you who drank my sweet tea, wasn't it? You know, they're going to accuse you. And so the accusative points directly. It points right at the direct object. Okay? So, and those are really just fancy ways of saying, here's the special hat that noun puts on. Okay? What outfit does Batman wear? I don't do this by myself. It's not how I teach. What outfit does Batman wear? Does he wear Superman's outfit? He wears Batman's outfit, right? What, what outfit does Superman wear? Superman's outfit, right? Okay, and that's how it should be. That's the way it works. Nouns are going to have to put on different outfits depending on what they're doing in the sentence. And they have to play by their own rules. And so I've given you a couple nouns there on the sheet. I'm going to start with the noun aqua, aquai. And I'm going to give you some endings. Singular, plural, nominative, accusative. So what this little chart tells me is if I have a noun like aqua, aquai, or I also gave you puella, puellae, and I gave you famina, famini. By the way, do you all notice the pattern? Do you observe the pattern in those nouns? What do you notice? No, not singular, plural. Sorry, that's just, that's a, that's a, that's not right. Sorry. I get really excited about that mistake because that's a very common mistake. What do you notice about those two forms? Anybody notice a pattern? What pattern? Fame, listen to it. Famina, famini. Poella, poellae. Aqua, aquae. What do you hear? D don't overcomplicate it. Uh, what does every one of those words have in common? Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I. When I hear a noun, and I see a noun that has those first two forms are a, uh, I, I know that I have a noun that fits what's called the first declension or the first pattern, okay? And I, when I teach my third graders, 
I use those words interchangeably. It's a first pattern, first declension. And declension just means that's how you change it. You change it according to its pattern, okay? And the whole first declension, which I do not give to third graders, I don't give it until fifth grade, goes like this. It goes, uh, I, I, um, ah, uh, uh, I, oops, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Okay? Why don't I give that to fourth or third graders, do you think? Isn't that overwhelming? That would be multa right there. I don't give it to my kids. I don't give it to third graders and fourth graders. I don't do it. I refuse to do it. If I can get you to understand this idea that nouns change based on what they're doing in the sentence with just two examples, I'm not going to throw six at you. I don't do that, and I highly recommend you don't do that. Because otherwise, you, you, you start juggling. And we could juggle one ball, all right? And we can kind of even juggle two balls. But by the time you get to six balls, hi yo, And that feels overwhelming to me, and that feels overwhelming to y'all, and you better believe it feels overwhelming to your third grader and your fourth grader. Okay? So the way Latin works then is it changes these endings depending on what the noun is doing in its sentence, in its context. Okay? So a subject noun, if it's a singular subject noun, it works like this. My subject noun is going to end in just a plain old A. Okay? So here we go. What does somebody think? Anybody think they know? Anybody think they know what the noun femina means? Woman. Yeah, like feminine, right? Okay. So here's our first complete Latin sentence. Femina portat. What does that sentence say? Well, I'm done here. Thank you. It's been great. No, that's it. How did you know that? This is what you've got to do with your third graders. How did you know that? Can anybody explain to me how you did that? Tell me more. Not just endings. I want, I, want a di I want my third graders to explain it. What about the endings? What? Good. So you see a nominative singular ending on a noun. And if it's a nominative singular, what is that noun doing in its clause? It's the subject noun. So grab your Shirley grammar or whatever grammar text you use and have your students label the sentence. If it's a nominative singular ending, then I know nominative subject noun. Nominative subject noun. Boom. Okay. Portat. What part of speech is portat? It's a verb. Good. And what's the ending on that verb? It's a T. Remember, ost. There it is. Third person singular verb. The woman carries. How ambitious should I be? Should I give you all a real good test here to see if you get this? Yeah. How about this? Anybody want to be courageous and come here? All right, fine. I won't make you come here. Would anybody like to try to verbally say, we carry women? It's pretty ambitious on my part. We'll see. We carry. Can anybody give me we carry? <gasps> One mistake. We carry women. Feminas bene, bene discipula. We have portamos feminas. Because the noun job of women, right? The noun job of women is a direct object. We carry, subject verb, portamos. What do we carry? Women, direct object. And if it's going to be my direct object, well, that means I need to put my accusative ending. And is it woman or women? Women. Wait, that one little letter makes a difference in English? Yeah, right? Sure does. So I need to put my accusative plural ending on there. We carry women. Let's do another sentence. Y'all are in trouble. You just didn't know it yet. Okay. How about this sentence? The girls carry water. I want to take 30 seconds. Everybody write down that sentence. The girls carry water. And I want you to label it with whatever system you guys use at home. The girls carry water. The girls carry water. 
So take a second. Always start with your verb. That's what my Greek teacher told me. Always start with the verb. What's the verb in this sentence? Carry. Carry. Good. Now we go to our subject noun. Who carries? Girls. Girls. Good. So there's my subject noun. What do the girls carry? Water. Water, Direct object. So here we go. Now we need to... That was just our English brain, right? Those of y'all who teach grammar program, that's just English, right? Subject noun, verb, transitive, direct object. Sound good? (coughs) Engage your Latin eyes. Here we go. If I have a subject noun, girls, what case in number is that going to be? Nominative plural. Because my subject noun goes into the nominative. And of course, girls is plural, not singular. How about water? It's a direct object. As a direct object, what case and number is water going to be? Accusative, singular, or plural? Water. Singular. Good. And our verb. That's the last thing we've got to label here. The verb is in an intimate relationship with? The subject. The subject noun. Good. So we have to look at our subject noun, girls, and carry. What person and number, then, is that verb going to be? Girls carry. Girls carry. Third person, singular or plural? Let's label it. The reason why we label in a nutshell is because it forces us to slow down and think fully through it. Make your third and fourth and fifth graders copy, label, and now translate. Our problem is not that we do too little. Our problem is that we do too much. Five sentences done like this is better than 20 sloppy, junked up there sentences. Okay? What f- is the form of girls? I gave you that. It's poella, poeli. What is the form of girls in the nominative plural? Poeli. Good. What is the form of our verb carry in the third person plural? Portant. Lovely. Ost mustisant. There it is. What is the form of our noun water in the accusative singular? Aquam. And the awesome thing is just like math now, you can have your students check their work, right? Did I put poella in the nominative plural like I said I needed to? Yes. Did I put my verb in the third person plural like I said I needed to? Yes. Did I put aqua in the accusative singular like I said I needed to? Yes. And the great thing is, as a teacher, is that gives me a checklist to see if my students get it or if they're just being sloppy. Because as y'all know, it's almost always sloppiness that's your problem, not comprehension. At least that's what I find. Is that, oh, I'll just stick it up there in the nominative, whatever. That's good enough. Okay. That's what students do. Okay. This forces them to slow down. And it's beautiful because of it. I want to do one more sentence just because I think Chris Perrin made me have to do this sentence when he said that order doesn't matter in Latin. But here you go. Last sentence. We're not going to get to adjectives. What? Why do you do the verb first? That is what I'm going to do right now. Okay. <laughs> so if you, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you can already anticipate why order doesn't matter in Latin. Aquas femina portat. Aquas femina portat. Copy, label, translate. Aquas femina portat. We always start with our verb. What's our verb? Portat, good. What person and number is portat? Third singular, ost. There it is. Now, here's the logic puzzle part of it. Ready? If I have a verb that ends in T, am I looking for a plural subject or a singular subject? Singular. Do you see how it can teach your eyes what to look for? We get to be detectives. 
I tell my students we get to play Batman, man. Look for clues. Be the master detective. Sherlock Holmes. What's our subject noun in the nominative singular? Femina. There it is. Nominative, singular, subject, noun. One more word left. Aquas. Accusative, singular or plural? Plural. So if it's accusative, that makes it the direct object. Can anybody give us a translation? The woman carries the waters. Why does an order matter? The case endings tell you where it goes. Right? If you ever, do you ever wonder why he, him, and his work in English? He is always a subject pronoun. Him is always an object pronoun. His is always a possessive pronoun. If you ever struggle with who, whose, and whom, same thing. Who is always a subject relative pronoun. Whose is always a possessive relative pronoun. Whom is always an objective relative pronoun. That's how it works. If this was my five-hour version of the seminar, we could get into that. Okay? That's third grade Latin. That's it. That's all we do in third grade. Last thing I'll make and comment I'll make, and then we'll take questions. Do you see how much harder this is and how much careful, more careful you have to be with this than with your third grader's math problems? You see what I'm talking about? Okay. Math problems in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, they're maybe one step or two step problems, right? Um, once you get into order of operations, let's say you have five minus three minus one. Oh, I have to do the parentheses and then I have to do outside the parentheses. Okay. Ready? One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus my three vocab terms. That's a 12 step problem. 12 steps. That's why it's fun. Okay? It's why nobody hangs out on easy Sudoku mode when they're good at Sudoku. You know what I mean? You're like, man, I want to get up to expert. I want to get the best. I want to be. Nobody likes just whooping easy things. But if you can teach your kids to desire the payoff, now we're talking virtue to suffer through the copy, label, translate for the payoff. And then once they get older and you start to sit in front of 2,000-year-old texts with 8th graders, that just blows all that other nonsense, pop nonsense out of their ears, man. Because you get to sit in front of something older and bigger and better than just you yourself. And that's why Latin is better to start with than other languages. Okay? All right. Any questions? Mm -hmm. So I've been told I need next year I need to start grammar. Okay. But we aren't doing Latin. Okay. So my question is, I can do Latin, uh, yeah, Latin on my own. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend, or would you recommend a certain curriculum for grammar? We we use Shirley starting in third grade. I can't remember the the name of the. Uh, by the way, hold on. Let me let let me say this. Sorry, I got ahead of myself by giving names. Um. I don't, nobody pays me to recommend any kind of curriculum. In a nutshell, what we need our kids to be able to do is know their parts of speech and identify them in context. Find a curriculum that teaches you to know your parts of speech and identify them in context. Because though we, we actually, I forgot to do this, we didn't talk about nouns. Remember how I made you define verbs? And I forgot to make you define nouns, okay? But if I can get students in third grade, fourth grade, shoot, fifth grade, who know their parts of speech rock solid, now we can start to play in other languages. So any curriculum, my, my kind of sine qua non of that without which it does not work, of curriculum is parts of speech in context. Labeling, diagramming, whatever it is that makes them look at words carefully. Because that's always the danger of what you're familiar with, right? Like your spouse. Is you just, right, the closer, in, the near in kin, the lesser in kindness, right? The closer it is to you, the less you pay attention to it. Sorry, that's Shakespeare. Um, but in a nutshell, the same thing works linguistically. Is, oh, English, it kind of, you know, it does its thing. And that now, whatever that is. So any curriculum that really makes you go back to parts of speech is what you want. Okay. Are there pronouns? 
There are pronouns in Latin, but they are a mess of a muddle of a puddle. So Latin, Latin has about four words that it uses as pronouns, depending on how you mean it. So Latin, um, in a nutshell, Latin has a form for that guy over there, this guy over here, or, or lady, or thing. That guy over there, this guy over here, the one, you know, the one. Um, and he himself, if you're talking about somebody famous, you could say like Cicero Ipses, Cicero himself. Anyway, um, so actually he has five now that I think about it. So anyway, there are a lot of different pronouns and most good Latin programs will not touch on pronouns until later on down the line because it's, it's just challenging, honestly. Yeah, there is. I mean, but you don't need it. Yeah, right. So you can see where you don't need it. So, for example, where you might use I and we and where the authors do use I and we is if they need to emphasize like Cicero. He has this great diatribe against Catiline where he's basically saying why he should put Catiline to death. And um, in it, he uses I a lot like I need to, you know, and so he's kind of just, yeah, you know, and so he's he's kind of emphasizing using the pronoun, but he doesn't need it, strictly speaking, grammatically speaking. But even that's a skill to learn. Like, oh, wait a second. He doesn't have to say I here. I wonder why he says I here. Oh, that's interesting. But you couldn't even make that observation without grammar. Right? And that's the blessing. Again, is it slows us down. You can't make observations in a language that you're used to like you can in a foreign language because it forces you to slow down. It's awesome for it. What else? Is there a Latin... Okay, I promise I'm not here to sell anything. But here's what I would say. Um, the problem that we ran into when I, uh, when I took over the school that I was at in Chicago, the problem that we had is that every Latin curriculum we ever looked at tried to do way too much way too quickly. And I'm not, I'm making myself an enemy of all and a friend of none, which is awesome. So they'll invite me back, I'm sure, next year. But um, basically, we just realized that everybody was going way too quickly, and we didn't need to go so quickly because we had years to cover this stuff. So... Um, we ended up writing a curriculum. It hasn't been published at this time, but hopefully that'll happen in the next couple of years. If you want to, you can contact me. You can, I think, I mean, I sell it for like dirt because I'm not trying to make money. I'm just trying to help people teach Latin. Um, I think it's like 15 bucks. and I will gladly send you the pages to print, um, but it's written for homeschooling parents. Um, go to my YouTube Latin lessons. High school curriculum is tough. Um, it dip, here's, my answer is it depends where they're at grammatically. If I had a student who came in and was rock solid on parts of speech in English, or maybe they'd done French or Ger- German's great, because German is case language also. It does some of this stuff. Not as complex as Latin, but basically. Um, so if I had that student, I'd probably start them with Wheelox Latin, um, W-H-E-E-L-O-C-K-S, um, Wheelox Latin. Um, but I'm actually teaching through um, a Latin grammar by a guy um, named, oh my goodness, uh, Catholic priest, 1905. Ah, what's his name? Henley. And, and I know that there are groans just from me saying that name. But here's what I would say about that curriculum. Um, we use Oxford Latin for our fifth graders through eighth graders. Um, but I, I think that might be a little bit cumbersome for a high school student. They probably want to go a little quicker than that. But that's a great curriculum for high school. It is. Um, but the thing I like about Henley, at least in the Christian tradition, um, is he does a pretty good job at the end of every like everything like this. He would give you 20 translations into English from Latin and 20 translations from um, pardon me from English into Latin. So you're always working out both sides of your body. Both sides of your brain, right? You're always going from Latin into English and English into Latin. Don't ever skip the English into Latin. It is the hardest, and that's why it's the best to do. It makes you work out more. Okay? So Henley's great. He gives a ton of practice, um, and I've come to appreciate that curriculum. And, and he does a pretty good job explaining things if you're, if you're kind of on a zero one as far as Latin goes. You, yeah, you can. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, as much as possible, really being ahead of your student. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're teaching violin or basketball or whatever, you know, guitar. Um, so I would say yes. But I, I would say, again, for you and for your kids, 
it is all about the foundation. It's all about grammar. Um, it is nobody, you know, nobody goes, yeah, right. Nobody goes to the, to Chicago to see those really cool foundations under those skyscrapers. They go for the pretty stuff on top, but you can't build the pretty stuff on top without the foundation. And that's what grammar and, and basic arithmetic are. So you're saying I need to go back and learn my English first. Probably, <laughs> probably, probably. And, but, but I would say just as quickly. And again, this is, this is what the classical tradition holds. It's through the, the alien that we learn the native. You know, and so Latin actually can help us with our English grammar. And so, um, for example, if you're working on direct objects, we actually teach direct objects simultaneous with Latin and English. And you do this on your videos on YouTube? I do. I do. Are you just enthusiastic? I'm, <laughs> I, am, I just love what I do. So I, I get, I'm the, the blessed to be able to do what I do. Um, if you have more questions, I will gladly answer them. But otherwise, it is 332. Thank you all so much for coming.